See that? See that over there? See that plant move? Yep, look at it. They're eating it. That's the water hyacinth, and uh, they will eat that whole plant up. They'll eat all of these up if they are hungry enough. That was starting to move. Yeah. They're getting after it. Hey, hello everybody, and welcome back to the homestead. We're out here by the pond today because there's been a lot of views coming recently to my video that I put up about how I got started with raising fish. And so it seems there's a lot of interest in that and that there may be a lot of people who want to get started in it. And so I thought I'd do a video quickly to tell you guys about some of the mistakes I made along the way. Uh, and then at the very end, I'm gonna give you a reason why none of those mistakes are actually mistakes. But here's some of the, I guess 10, <laughs> 10 mistakes that I made along the way. I have my little list here, so I'm gonna keep looking at this. I apologize for that. But number one, number one mistake I made was going too small to start with, okay? Uh, if we look over here to the side, you can see that old tank over there? Yeah, that was my catfish tank. And originally it was my tilapia tank, and then, uh, then we got the catfish, and we moved uh, the tilapia into the big pool over here. But it was too small in the sense that those catfish were gonna grow really big, and I ordered way too many catfish for that size of tank. So size your tank properly to the fish that you want to have in there. Do your research, know what it is that you're doing with how big those fish are going to get and how big they're going to need when they get fully sized. Uh, so that was my number one mistake. Number two mistake was going too big. Okay, this pool over here uh, is too big for my ability to catch the fish. Now, I say that and there are workarounds. I can build traps, I can do things in there to get, to, to catch the fish. I can use bigger nets and whatnot. Uh, but for what I have right now, if I wanna be able to catch a fish, it's not easy. I might as well just get the fishing pole out. The idea of getting in there with, with the little net that I have doesn't work. They got too much room to escape. Uh, so size it right, you know, it's also in my, on my back porch here. It takes up a lot of space and I kind of like to reclaim that. Someday I'll move it off to a different so spot, but Kind of hard to do when there's a lot of fish in there. I don't have someplace else to put them in the meantime. All right, number three mistake was the wrong type. So this pool, I've talked about it before, is not exactly appropriate for um, this kind of project. They work, you can do it. The pump that I have over there in the pool, it has to pull the waste out. And as it's doing so, it macerates it all. And it just builds up this bit cloudy and it's hard to remove macerated waste like that. Because this is not a hard-sided pool, I couldn't put in a overflow the way I did on my other system. And we've talked about that in the past, I'll talk about it some more. I was eventually able to put one in here, but it's too small. It's, it's, it's really not large enough to be able to handle the volume. Hey, quick interruption here. I realized as I was editing the video that I'm talking about this overflow here as if people know what it is. Some people may not know what I'm talking about, so let me tell you what this is. They're really, really amazing. You can see that pipe that goes down into the water right there. Down at the bottom of it has a cap with some slots in it, some holes that allow waste material, fish poo, right, to get to enter and to go up the pipe because just that's the way that water's going to go, right? Water's coming up the pipe and it's going to go along over there and it comes out. The water level then cannot go any higher than that so long as it's not rising faster than it can exit. That is an exit. So it's called an overflow because the water is overflowing out of here. It's a solids lifting overflow because the solids are entering, they're rising up, and the solids are going to follow, flow out that pipe. Then they come down through here, through that pipe, they come out the side. right? And they go along over there to these other filters. This is a solid separator, okay? So the solids go in here and get separated. We talk about that in another one of my videos you can check out where I built these solid separators. But what I wanted you to understand is the solids lifting overflow, which is that. If you were prepared, if you wanted to go through it, you can actually, there are some kinds of um, uh, patch systems that you can put a larger uh, what is that called? A ballast or something? Bulkhead. Man, total brain fart there. 
there are bulkhead fittings that you can put into the side of these things, but you probably want to do that before you have a bunch of water in there, creating pressure outwards that might cause it to tear and your fish to all go out and die. So a little late for that, but I was able to, it was a factory installed one uh, for some of the pool filtration equipment that would be there for the regular pool. It's just too small. It's only about a, less than even, um, not even an inch and a half. I think it's like an inch and a quarter or something. So I was able to make something work, but it doesn't process enough material. Number four, not being prepared for breeding. <laughs> it was something I was hoping to have happen. I wasn't really prepared for it when it did happen. I didn't really know what to do. <laughs> the original plan was to actually be able to take uh, a couple of females and the male and put them in a separate tank and have them uh, be a breeding colony. Well, that didn't ever come to fruition. And next thing I knew, they were breeding in the pond. And I had no idea what to do. So I had to uh, panic and go try and figure out what to do. Uh, so be prepared, do some research so that you know what's coming and you can you know, plan for that. Uh, it's pretty simple though. Uh, if you want to let them do it in there, that's fine. They can do it in there. And, and most of the babies will survive, not all of them. Some of them are gonna die. You probably have better success if you were able to actually get the fry and put them into a dedicated space to grow them out. But it's okay to leave them in there, just as long as you provide them with some shelter, some places to go hide, uh, some whatever it is, some baskets, some containers, uh, some buckets, anything like that, that they can go hide in some plants, um, some underwater fake plants even. Uh, you could do some of that. Whatever it is, just provide some kind of shelters for them to be able to go into the hide and get away from the other fish. Number five. Oh, this was a bad one. Killing with chlorine. Yes. Uh, so in the beginning, I was using little um, little jugs of fluid that you would put a capful or so into a bucket of water, a five-gallon bucket, and it would take out the chlorine. Uh, very um, poor. It, it works for a small scale, but when you've gotten to the, trying to do a, a pool like this, it didn't work. And I wanted at one point to fill the pool a little bit. It was before I had all the tilapia in there. I had just some minnows and such. And I overfilled it too much, and it was straight hose water without a filter on it, and that chlorine killed everything. So chlorine will kill your system. Fortunately, I learned that before I had the tilapia in there. But yes, chlorine will kill the system. It kills all of the bacteria, kills the fish, kills anything that's in there if you get too much of it. Okay, I mean, I'm a little drop in the 1,000-gallon pool is not going to hurt it, but if you you know, fill that thing halfway with chlorinated water, you're gonna have all your fish dead probably. So be very, very careful. Um, if you're using a hose, put a pre-filter on it and make sure you know how much that pre-filter has been used and how much life it has left. Uh, I try and test mine periodically, about once a week. I test it just to make sure it's still good on chlorine. Um, you know, put it, it put just even a gallon and then put a little test strip in there, see how we're doing on chlorine, okay? Um, okay, number six was not using pond plants sooner. Boy, I sure wish I would have done, done it sooner because they have helped tremendously to keep the water cleaner. So right now we have these big ones here. These are water hyacinth. Um, the fish love them. They, they're in there right now and we saw them eating those earlier. Uh, those plants that are in there, within a couple of days, they'll be gone. The ones over here, these are protected. The ones that are free floating out there, they'll be gone in a couple of days. The fish will have them all eaten up. Uh, the other ones in the smaller, um, smaller little wraps over there. Let's take a closer look at that. All right, these other plants here, these are water lettuce. Okay, and I started out with just one, uh, one of these plants, and had them in here for about three weeks now, and they've grown into those. There was a few extras I tossed out, so they're growing what growing quickly. All right, so yeah, we have the water hyacinth, we have the water lettuce, I've also used duckweed in there, and um, they all are great. Uh, the, the duckweed can, I mean, the fish love to eat that stuff. I had trouble growing it though throughout the winter, it died off. We'll see how this stuff does over the winter, it may die off as well. But the reason why I didn't get started sooner with plants is because I didn't know where to get them. You know, and I'd go to my local nurseries, call around, and they didn't have them. I had no idea where to get these things, and lo and behold, guess where you can find every, anything? Amazon, <laughs> Amazon, eBay, that's where I ended up buying these plants from. And uh, they, you know, they, they send you out, I got one of the water lettuces, I think I got a few bulbs of the hyacinth. You throw them in there and within a few weeks, boom, you got lots of plants. Uh, so they do a great job of 
cleaning the water. They're also a supplemental food uh, for the fish. Okay, let's go on to num not fully cycling my tank. All right, so the nitrogen cycle, if you don't know about it, do your research and really find out how that works and understand how to cycle your tank through the nitrogen cycle before you put in your uh, tilapia or catfish or whatever it is that you are raising. Um, I did not fully cycle my tank. It was almost there, but it wasn't fully there. And so when I first put my tilapia in there, the fingerlings that I got originally, they struggled and a few of them died. Um, so keep that in mind that you want to make sure. Now, what you can do is I was able to get some minnows from my back pond, a natural pond that we have here on the property. I was able to get some minnows from there to put them in and see if the minnows survived. And they, I thought, were doing fine. So that's when I tested it by, well, that was my test. And then I put the uh, tilapia in there only to find that it wasn't fully cycled. It was almost there, but it wasn't quite fully there. But anyways, you can use some cheap fish that you can get from a pet store or something that uh, you can use to test it and see if, if you're right. Um, okay, let's move on to not, speaking of testing, not testing the water. That was another mistake that I made. Now my, my system is really balanced now and it doesn't fluctuate up and down, but in the early stages, in the first probably six months or so, um, you should be testing the water very regularly just to make sure that you're not having spikes or dips in, in essential things like you know if your nitrates are getting super high or if you are introducing chlorine. Um, you wanna make sure that you're aware of these things if the ammonia levels are getting out of control. Uh, so that you make sure that your system is working right and if you need to address a problem, you address the problem before you have a real issue. Uh, where you saw in some of my other videos, you may have seen where I've had you know catfish die because of nitrate spikes and stuff. And uh, so make sure you're testing it properly. Uh, the next thing would be no backup air supply. So why is my tank over here empty? Well, because we had a power outage and I didn't have backup air supply and so I lost all my catfish. All right, I still don't have backup air supply. I haven't figured out how to really do it. Still working to try and resolve that issue. I mean, I know that there's things like solar stuff, but they don't, they aren't perfect. There's not really a good plug and play solution. Um, if there is, and somebody knows of it, please let me know. Because the ones that I've seen, they're just too small. They, they may, might, might work for like a 20, 50 gallon aquarium, but not for this. Uh, so if somebody has any solutions on that, I'd love to hear about it. Let me know. Um, I, what I did get is something that's gonna alert me on my cell phone if the power goes out here uh, at the outlet where this is all plugged into. Um, it'll, it'll give me an alert. If I'm at work or something, I can uh, come home and make sure we hook up a generator or something, hopefully before the fish suffer and die. So make sure you do your research to find some kind of backup air supply. Even if it's, even if it's not a full you know, pumping system to pump all the water through the filters, at least keep them oxygenated in the meantime. Final mistake I wanna talk about is not doing aquaponics. Yeah, uh, in the comments, a lot of people have mentioned before, well, why don't you do aquaponics? And uh, I, I agree, I probably should be doing aquaponics. See, here's the thing. I have a big garden, and I do a lot of gardening in the dirt, in the soil. Aquaponics is a whole different beast from what I'm doing here, which is aquaculture. Aquaponics will involve different kind of grow beds, um, where the water cycles through the grow beds, flooding and draining and flooding and draining, uh, or different wraps in the, in the pond. Um, and I would like to do some of that in the future here. I didn't do it to begin with because it was just more than I could handle at the time. I had so much going on. I just wanted to get started with this. I had an urgency to get the fish going. Maybe I'll add the aquaponics thing here soon. Maybe it'll be later, but I do intend to do it sometime here in the future. Right now, I'm happy with raising the fish. But if you have the time, if you want to sit down and figure out all of that and do it all at once, aquaponics would be the ultimate way to go. It would be much better than just the aquaculture because so much of the, the problems that I have would take care of themselves with the aquaponics system. Okay? All right, now let me tell you why all of these things are not really mistakes. I've said before how when you reach the end of what you know it's time to go make some mistakes, well, that's kind of what I did as I reached the end of what I knew. And so 
we've made mistakes. And I just told you about a bunch of the mistakes I've made. But they're not mistakes in the sense that at least I'm doing it. And I have this now that I wouldn't have had had I thought about, oh man, I'm, I'm terrified of making mistakes. No, be prepared to make mistakes. Mistakes are okay. That's how you learn. That's how you grow. And if you're not willing to make mistakes, you're just going to stand still your whole life. All right. Hey, I thank you for the watch, watching the video. If you found any of this helpful or you have any tips, suggestions, comments, anything like that, please drop them down below and you have yourself a wonderful day. Bye-bye.